Pastor, it's our probably about our 11th week together doing this. Right. Uh, if you would, Pastor, uh, we're talking about Matthew. You had the big context last, last week. And you, and you narrowed it down a little bit for us. Can you recap for us? Sure. Uh, this week we kind of got more into the, just the technical part of who's the author, when was it written, what was the purpose of the book. And then we, we talked about fulfillment as the major theme of the book, and we said, okay, what are some of the foundational sub-themes of fulfillment? And I listed four, which is not exhaustive, but I think four of the more important ones. Uh, Christology. The, the fact that he is God's anointed one. Uh, and, and then the, the conflict and, and confrontation that goes through uh, Jesus' entire ministry, uh, his authority that goes along with that too, because he really was, and I, I didn't say this this morning, but I said it last, the other night when I did the recording. You know, when, when they would say to Jesus, you're, you're, you and your disciples are doing something wrong. He never said, you know, you're right. We, we messed up. <laughs> he never said that one time. Uh, we, and we talked about the church and its mission, and we talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, various uh, facets of kingdom is also very important in the book of Matthew. Okay. I always start with this question. Did you learn or see something? that you hadn't seen in the past? Yes, and I wish I'd given more thought to that question because I know it's always coming up. <laughs> it is always. I, I think just what I just said a while ago, the fact that Jesus, in, in his authoritative statements, he, he never backs down. His self-awareness is such that he knows that he is the Son of God. He knows that. That's his consciousness, and he never turns aside from that. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Dave. One interesting thing, and I went back and did just some kind of reading through, back through the Gospel of Matthew this afternoon because it made me think on the kingdom, the interesting thing with Matthew is he does use kingdom of heaven yeah. most of the time. Right. Kingdom of God just a few times, but kingdom of heaven so I thought, well, that's interesting, was reading through some stuff and see it. You know, almost every time he uses the kingdom of heaven, he's teaching or he's directly confronting the Pharisees. And he uses that as a contrast to the kingdom of earth. Yeah. So here's the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of earth. It's like this down here, but this is how it should be. Here's how it is, you know, in the kingdom of heaven. This, this kingdom that he is the king of. It's just always neat to me because he comes and he's not going to be the earthly king they want. He's the king of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And the, all these things are pointing. Here's the principles of the kingdom of heaven. Here's what the kingdom of heaven is like. You know, the kingdom of heaven is like this and this and this. It's a different realm. It's a different way. Okay. All right. Brother Derek. Yeah, the, uh, actually the, the Jewish flavor of that gospel is something that was driven home to me son of david that reference to christ we see it even as early as the genealogies of matthew one okay. you know we have david actually listed twice in those genealogies mm -hmm. um and and going back to the hebrew the uh this thing called gematria where numbers are significant dvd you know the hebrew had no vowels or they didn't write in vowels the D represented the number four, and six was a V, so DVD, those two, those three numbers added together was 14. And you see there's 14 generations between Abraham. He started with Abraham, the father of the Jews, okay. and goes all the way to through Joseph to Jesus. And uh, that, that really stood out for me. This, that term son of David was used nine times in Matthew. And like four times in Mark, and three times in Luke. So I mean, it's it's a it's a recurrent theme, and and the placement of the Gospel of Matthew in our canon at the very beginning, it is a perfect launching pad from the Old Testament cut with all the references, the 55, 54 references back, literal references back to the Old Testament. Yeah. It's a beautiful springboard. To the new covenant 
Yeah. We started mentioning those Hebrews and no vows and stuff. I started having flashbacks. On this <laughs> I barely made it through Hebrew. I barely made it through English. Uh, you were talking about something about the conservative nature of the book of Matthew. I think in your sermon you, you talked about the conservative nature of Matthew. Can you expound on it a little bit more? What I mean by that is that many think that he's, instead of going completely to a new covenant, that he's kind of like a halfway house because he, he emphasizes the law. And he does emphasize Son of David. He does emphasize all of those Old Testament terms. But I think it is because of the idea of fulfillment. And I like what Derek said. Matthew is the perfect springboard from Old Covenant to New Covenant because he deals with the idea of the law, but not in the sense that the law is somehow tweaked and carried on, but that the law is fulfilled in Jesus, and now we have a new covenant in Jesus as well. You know, we use that passage in Matthew at Lord's Supper about, this is my blood given for the new covenant. It's a new covenant. Okay. Conservative, go ahead. Give me what you got. <laughs> Just when you, I'm, I'm with Kenny, you know, it's not conservative in, in terms of the law. Uh, but when it comes across, I guess the conservative nature is, hey, everything in the Old Testament was true, was right. Yeah, right. You know, you've got all these prophecies, you've got all these promises of God. Right. God's fulfilling all of them. Okay. You know, the fulfillment part of it. Here's Christ. And he fulfills all these promises. He is the Jewish Messiah, the son of Abraham, the promise of Abraham, the seed that blesses all nations. None of that has changed. You know, he is it. Here he is. You know, it's the Pharisees who have built a different system, <laughs> don't like <laughs> this fulfillment of the prophecy. They reject him. But as he tells them, they reject God because this was God's plan all the way. He's the promise of Abraham. Okay. Let me just jump back in. Uh -huh. Son of David. Right. Son of Abraham represent unconditional covenants, the yeah. two unconditional covenants of the New Testament. I mean, okay. of, the, of the Old Testament. Yeah, the that the conservative nature of Matthew. I mean, he Christ hit the he hit from the very beginning of his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was radical. So I don't know that I would really call it conservative. I mean, his, his message was very unsettling to the authorities at the time who questioned his genealogy, his, his birth, <laughs> but we have no record of them ever, actually ever even investigating or asking the question, where was he born? Okay. You know, and we have this analogy with, between Christ and the nation of Israel, he comes on board as the obedient son, obedient unto death, you know, 40 days in the wilderness, like 40 years in the wilderness. He was tested, but he came out as the true son of Israel, the obedient son. So that's going to be another. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about law. Okay. There was a lot said about law. Uh, and, and sometimes we get in a cl cliche with people and we don't define it for them. I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean, I'm not under the law? In light of the scripture we use today where Christ said, I didn't come to abolish it, I came to fulfill it. Am I, going, am I going first or second? Oh, sir, you're going first. <laughs> no, wait a minute. No, go ahead. <clears throat> well, when we think about Matthew, let's also think about Hebrews. Hebrews. Let's yeah. also think about Galatians. So the law serves a purpose. Okay. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is from God. Okay. Jesus kept the law for us. So when Jesus takes upon himself the curse of the law, because he has kept everything about that law, then that law is kept once and for all. And th then the, the emphasis or the goal of Christians is not then, okay, Jesus has kept the law for us and now we can, 
we can take the law and we can refine it, make it like we want it, customize it, and keep it. You know, dietary. suggestions. We'll, we'll, we'll throw out the dietary part and we'll okay. throw out some other parts of the uh-huh. cultic law. And, uh, because when, when Paul talks about law, in the way I understand law, in, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is the law. I mean, the five books of Moses, that's the law. All of it. Not part of it, not the Ten Commandments. All of it is the law. And we're not under that law. We're under a new covenant because Jesus kept that law for us. Now, that's not to say that we're antinomian, that we're against the law, because we're not against the law. But, but we, f- we follow Christ, and Christ would never lead us, I think, to, to violate the law, but the, the, the law is not our goal. It's not what we're trying to shoot for. We're trying to be like Christ. We have the mind of Christ because we have the Holy Spirit, and so we're, we're living like Christ laid out for us to live. Christ is our lawgiver, not Moses. That's what I mean when I talk about the law. Hmm. Okay. Pastor Dave. Tempted to just say, well, I'm antinomian, but that's... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, but when you come back, it. I love this, and this ultimately... You know, and I've argued New Covenant for a long time, and you read in so many things about, especially me being a Gentile, was never put under that law. I love when Paul goes back to argue with the disciples. He's like, why do you want to put them under something we couldn't keep? (laughs) You know, we haven't been able to keep because they weren't under it. And you're trying to push them under. And then in Galatians, he really distinguishes between the, law, the covenant of Abraham, covenant of grace, the promise of Christ, right. and the covenant of Moses, which is a, a legal establishment of a nation. It's also very conditional. And there is no grace in the Mosaic law. I mean, there's no grace that you break the law. You know, somebody's going to die. There's no forgiveness for intentional uh, sin. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, and you're even making sacrifices, killing animals for unintentional sin. You're giving, <laughs> you know, for what I'm not even thinking of that I don't know about. Here's this other offering. Here's, you know, you've got all these offerings going back to try and cover all these sins. So there's, you know, there's retribution. There is sense of there's death going along with sin. Even though it's not mine, I've got someone dying in my place for all the sins and stuff. And, and, and that's really one of the reasons why the Pharisees hated him. I agree. I, I mean, because I mean, the law he, was an instrument he, of their power. He he kept their law in both uh, in rule and spirit, but then he would come back and I say unto thee, oh that, and he would do things too, like plucking grain on the Sabbath, and they'd say, hey, you and your disciples are plucking grain on the Sabbath. That's unlawful. And he says, wait a minute. Hey, go back and read your history books, David. Eight on the Sabbath, Eight him, him and his guys. Yeah. And B, the Sabbath was not created for, uh, or the man was not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath created for man. I mean, so Jesus had an answer for them that was the, whoa. We whoa. hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they can hear oh, now, baby. Got it, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think you might need to turn that down a little bit. How about, how about now? Is, is that good? I, I have okay. no hearing in my left ear, but I mean, we're all right. <laughs> How about mics? We're here. You hear Mike? Okay, we're good right. then, John. You hear? Yeah. <laughs> great, great discussion. Thank you. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about this. The, the Old Testament law, right, is not what the Pharisees were emphasizing. They were emphasizing their own interpretation of what the law was. I mean, it got to be ridiculous, the law. But it comes back to a law mindset. We still have that today. People don't just start off intentionally thinking, well, I'm going to just build this whole system and usurp God. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of people out there who are legalistic, but they think they're serving God, they're being obedient. But it's the also fair, it's a closet attempt to establish your own righteousness, yeah. too. Well, that's where you okay. end up yeah. when you go too far. But, but if I'm a good Pharisee and I'm not supposed to do this on the Sabbath, why not make these rules to make sure I don't even get close to doing that on the Sabbath? 
So if I can't walk but, you know, a certain amount of, you know, if, well, if I go this far, that's going to be considered like work or travel. Out. So let me make a rule to make sure I never go that far. You know, if I can only pull this ox out, let me make some rules to say that's all I do and nothing else until you get guidelines. If you start there, the intention's good. But the problem is you're making laws. You're just making laws, and they're all man-made laws, and the law was never intended to save or sanctify. Never was. That Mosaic covenant was never an instrument of salvation. That's what Paul goes to. He's like, no, the Abraham covenant was always the real covenant, the covenant. You know, this other covenant given later never takes away from the primary covenant. And so that's the law. And so when we come at it, here's where I think we get in good discussions with other things, but when we mess up, and trying to get people to live righteously by law is you can have the law become your whole hermeneutic key. You interpret the whole Bible based on law and the rules instead of the hermeneutic key is Christ. And everything's interpreted based on Christ and he gives us a law. You go back, you were talking about the but I say. You're talking about a but I say. It's not don't murder. It's don't lose your temper with your brother. Don't be angry with him. And, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, it's the thoughts, intentions. Everything comes into play. Here's who you're called to be. This is what real holiness and righteousness is. And that's why our only hope is Christ. I, I want Derek to, to kind of <laughs> okay, go ahead. top that off. Then I want to go back to something he said and kind of tweak it a little bit. All right. We're, we're, Derek, before we get to the tweak. Yeah. That was part of, part of the problem with the Old Covenant was, you know, the blood of bulls and goats could not save. That's right. Could not cleanse you from your sin. The New Covenant where God writes his laws in your heart and you walk, as Paul said, walk in the Spirit to fulfill the law. You, you, part of being a new creation in Christ is having new desires, desire to please him, to serve, and submit. I mean... His yoke is easy. His burden is light. So why would you want to go back and embrace something that was your tutor, your guardian? Your um, mirror. And, you know, even in you know, Reformed or uh, other denominational circles, they'll sit there and they'll look at the Old Testament law and they'll try to divide it up. You know, the moral law and the civil and the ceremonial. You don't see those categories in the New Testament. And then you've got some problems there. How do you define what's the Sabbath? Is that moral? Is it ceremonial? Is it civil? I mean, you could make a good case for it being in all three of them. Yep. Well, I'm going to let you tweak, but I must comment on <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, that's uh, good. Every time I do communion, uh, Lord's Supper, chaplain, I'll say communion. Uh, every time I do the Lord's Supper, I remind people what it must have been like to, to go and have the priest set, sprinkle that blood on the altar. And you walk away and you go, did that really cover my sins? Did that really, I was done once a year, did that really do that? And we move towards Christ and we know it just didn't cover my sins. Right. The scripture is very clear that it cleansed me, made me whiter than snow, made me a, a, an heir, a child of the king. Amen. Uh, so w we have that, but we still have those. Uh, uh, Pastor, go ahead and tweak it. <laughs> well, you can finish your thought. No, I mean, no, really, no, I, I was I, leaning into what you're saying. I just would go back to one thing he said. He said there was no grace in the old covenant. Hmm. That's true as far as Old Covenant as a vehicle. There's, as far as causal law, case law, no, there's no grace. I mean, Moses said, God, we found this guy picking up sticks. What should we do? God says, what do you mean, what should you do? What does the law say? You stone him. But the grace was behind the law, beneath the law, and God himself in that those folks who could not be cleansed by the law, who could not be saved by the law, many of them did receive mercy from God and grace from God, but not through the law. The law as a vehicle was not gracious, but it was also grace that God gave them the law to start with to show them who he was. I wholeheartedly agree with you on that, Pastor. That, and within that, that, that period, 
gave them that system where he would be in their midst. Right. And they Absolutely. could at least be outside the yeah. courtyard. You know. and, and gave Moses as that picture of grace the whole time. Yeah. Moses going into the tent of meeting and meeting with God. Okay, so we, we plowed through that thing called law, right? Okay. Right. Let, let's tr flip to the other side because we say we're a people under grace. What about people who cheapen that grace? Yeah, and that's as common as maybe more common today than yes. people who want to keep the law or, or make some kind of legalistic principles. Uh, grace is, is, it costs God. It is a gift of God to us, but it's, it's not free, it's not cheap. It's, it, it, the, in the free gift of God, Christ died for our sins, but he made us new creatures so that when grace is not, okay, Jesus took care of my sins and I can do anything I want to and live like I want to and it doesn't matter what I do. That's cheap grace. It is. Grace is, thank God, Jesus has saved me, paid the price for my sin, and has changed me so that I can serve and worship him. To me, that's, that's great. Grace is knowing God. Grace is having God's presence with you. There's no greater gift than God himself. Pastor Dave. And I was just two things on that. First, like with the law, I think we cheapen grace when we try to earn stuff by keeping the law after that right. instead of truly valuing what Christ has done for us. But on the other side, we cheapen grace when we just deny or cheapen sin. Yeah. You know, we're in a society that did not want to call hardly anything sin and, and, and justify it and make it okay. Or, or the worst, say, well, it's not that bad. I'm not that bad. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is when Lot's leaving, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. He's been wanting to stage, all and all they say he's going, can I just go to Zoar? In the Hebrew, that literally means insignificant. This, this little insignificant. It's not that bad. Can I just go there? They're not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. I'm thinking, just think of that attitude. Well, they're not as bad. I don't really want to leave all the way. Can I just go to this? Not. That's where we get and we think. We do these things, but our sin, oh, it's not. I wasn't that bad a person. I'm not that bad. That sin isn't that bad. Or if we see a sin out there, well, we, you know, we go through all these things to try and justify it and make it not that bad. Well, if we don't understand how awful our sin is, then what Christ paid for it's not that much, not that bad. Okay. I mean, but he paid for our sin, and we understand that our sin is a direct attack on God. I think that's one of those key things of the Holy Spirit. When it convicts us of sin, is that we have sinned against God. Kind of go back to David in Psalm 51. Even though he had sinned in many ways, he says, against you only have I sinned. Only against thee. Yeah, he understands I have sinned against God. I have went against my Creator. My Lord, my King, I mean, everything, I am against Him. I mean, sin it, is it awful. Took, it took me the longest time to understand that statement. Because when I was young and immature, oh, buddy, you, what, what about these people? Yeah, here? what about Uriah, Bathsheba, Uriah, Uriah yeah. the Hittite? I mean, you know, you <laughs> the only, people of Israel, yeah, everything you did. And, and then I came to the conclusion when, when I sin against my brother or do something against my brother, it is directly against it's my against Heavenly God. Father. That's right. That, that was a growing moment for me, and that, that one statement right there. Yeah. And I think we, when we do that, we dishonor Christ on the cross, what he did for us, what he paid for us. I mean, he paid. Think about the punishment of our sin. I would have spent an eternity in hell paying for my sin, and Christ took that on the cross for me. Brother Derek, I'm going to change. Can I change up on you, throw a curve? Throw a curve. Throw a curve. Ahead. As you look at the book of Matthew, What's your favorite section? I knew you were going to ask that. You, you it's like asking asking someone, who's your, which is your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> well, my children would say I had one. I mean, <laughs> it, it has to be my favorite book in the New Testament. Really? It's your favorite book. Oh, wow. When I was 33 years old and a young co-worker shared the gospel year. with me, Okay. he gave me, he wrote down a page full of verses to read in John. Wow. But I was hard-headed. I went to Matthew, and I began to read. Mm -hmm. And then it, I'd read, and then the next day in the office, I'd ask him, what did this mean? What does this mean? And 
the Lord just convicted me. I mean, for two weeks there, the hound of heaven was all over me, convicting me. It's on your track. That's why I love this book. Okay, so you so, love the whole book. I love the whole book. I love the Sermon on the Mount. That's, that, that's why I taught. You know, I wanted to teach that. Um, there's a lot of ethical teachings mm -hmm. in the Sermon on the Mount. Right. Um, and it is hard. It is hard to teach. It is, it is challenging. You, I don't know that there is a good outline of the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think anybody, R.T. France even said that. He's like, I don't think there is a satisfactory outline on the Sermon on the Mount. It's just, I mean, it's just filled with things to get you to, to assess your own life. Okay. I mean, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now we're got, we've got examples of the citizens of heaven and how they are to be. Okay. Pastor, same question. I, th I think I like the parables in Matthew. He, he, he has a lot of parables, especially chapter 13, the way Jesus explains the parables. Uh, Sermon on the Mount... I wish I could spend a lot more time in preaching a series on Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount. I'll probably get to spend three or four weeks at most, brother. <laughs> but I got to tell you something. To me, Sermon on the Mount is heavy duty. Mm. I mm. just saw Robin stand up. Yeah, I did too. Okay. Yes. I'll be quick. Mine's mine's fun. Which I love in Matthew. It goes to the crucifixion when he dies. You get the first the beautiful picture of the veil being rent from the top. You yeah. know, you're told that it's rent from the top all the way down, God tearing the barrier between him and his people. Fulfilled. But then the resurrection of the saints, when the tombs, tombs are opened open. yeah, and the spirits cool. and they're walking through Jerusalem. Just like that, I mean, that would be so cool. Fun, like <laughs> Terrifying like, and cool to see. Uncle George. <laughs> you know, yeah. wonder, do you recognize, is that Abraham? Is that, <laughs> who's, who's walking around? Who are these people, yeah. you know, having their bodies brought back out of the tomb and resurrected with the resurrection of Christ? I think that's just, that is so much fun. That's just sweet to you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm on forgiveness. I love that, that chapter on forgiveness. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. that's bold. Wow, yeah, it's a a great story that goes with that too, you know. And 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 then it was it is it an eighteen where he talks about it? Is are you doing about seven or eighteen? Eighteen. A O mm -hmm. eighteen. That is a great story. It is. Oh, it's almost like that with uh, the prophet going to David. Thou art the man. Mm -hmm. Oh my, yeah. boy, that has yeah. to sting a little. Pastor, I'm at, I'm at the end of my time. I have so enjoyed being here with you guys today. Derek, thank you for being you. here, Appreciate Pastor Dave. Pastor Kenny, uh, would you wrap this up and tell us where we're going next Sunday and lead us in prayer? Okay, so next Sunday we'll go officially into the exposition of Matthew. We'll cover chapter 1. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the genealogy because I did that right before Christmas. So I'm going to spend more time on the Holy Spirit and Joseph and what happens uh, toward the end of the chapter. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing next Sunday. Oh, okay, Pastor. Give me some prayer, would you? Father, what a wonderful thing it is to come and study your word and, Lord, to share it with each other, Lord, the, the depths of your word and, Lord, how you, through your Holy Spirit, are teaching us truths that we can share with each other. And I thank you for what uh, this brings to the message, what it brings to our body of believers here at Bonaire and to those who are watching on YouTube and Facebook, I pray that for all of them that they would be enriched spiritually by what we've said here tonight, and I pray that you would build them up in the most holy faith. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.